Greetings, one and all. Vice Chair Shauna Kalmys presiding this evening. Barbara e is away. Um, welcome to the Open Space and Ecology Committee meeting of July 27th, 2022. Next. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and stop share and try to reshare and see if that will fix it. Uh, and close a couple other things in the meanwhile. Yeah. Everything works perfectly until we're rolling. Is the Brown Act statement in the made in the meeting minutes? Could Shauna maybe? It's, not, in, the, it's in the agenda. Maybe she could read that while you're trying to figure it out. Uh, it would be great if you have it handy. I'm going to go ahead and just completely close the slides and try to reopen them. OK, I, uh, yes, I think I have it here. Um, so I'm looking at a different page, so don't mind me if I'm looking strangely. Um, this meeting is compliant with the Ralph M. Brown Act as amended by the California Assembly Bill Number 361, effective September 16th, 2021, providing for the health for a public health emergency exception, to the standard teleconference rules required by the Brown Act. The purpose of this is to provide a safe environment for the public, staff, and committee members while allowing for public participation. The public may address the committee using exclusively remote public comment options. The committee may take action on any item listed in the agenda. Public meeting videos. Members of the public may, be, may view the Open Space and Ecology Committee meeting by logging into the Zoom meeting listed below. Open Space and Ecology meetings may also be viewed live and or on demand via the city's YouTube channel, www.youtube.com backslash Brisbane CA or on Comcast channel 27. Archived videos can be replayed on the city's website, brisbaneca.org backslash meetings. To address the committee, the Open Space and Ecology Committee, OSEC meeting will be an exclusively virtual meeting. The OSEC agenda materials may be viewed online at brisbaneca.org at least 24 hours prior to a special meeting and at least 72 hours prior to a regular meeting. Remote public comment. Meeting participants are encouraged to submit public comments in writing in advance of the meeting. Aside from commenting while in the Zoom meeting, the following email and text line will also be monitored during the meeting and public comments received will be read into the record during oral communications or during an item. Email is a atherton at brisbaneca.org. Join the meeting by Zoom. It's brisbaneca.org backslash Zoom hyphen OSEC. Meeting ID number 976-4295-0160. Passcode 544511. The call-in number is 669-900-9128. If you, if you need special assistance to participate in this meeting, please contact Adrian Etheridge at aetherton at brisbaneca.org or at 415-508-2118. Notification in advance of the meeting will enable the city to make a reasonable arrangements <laughs> to ensure accessibility during this meeting. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right, we're going to call the meeting to order. And we will do a roll call. Um, Michelle Salmon. Uh, here. Feldman. Glenn. Myself here. Mary Rogers. Here. Aaron Becker. Here. 
Noonan? Yep. <laughs> Shada Kalmies, I'm here as well. I believe we have a quorum. Um, okay, we are going to call for the adoption of the agenda. Yes, no. I move that we adopt the agenda. I'll second. And then you call all in favor, and then all we in have favor. a roll call vote. We have a roll call vote. Favor. Mary Unique. Rogers. Yes, approved. Becker. Approved. Jason. Approved. Bell Salmon. Approved. Yes. Families approves. The, adopt the agenda has been adopted. Announcements? Are there any announcements from staff? I have two. Uh, recognize Glenn. Okay, first of all, I have a report, which is gonna be backwards. Uh, the title is The State of Salmon. This was <laughs> by the Tuolumne River Trust. And it's relevant to Brisbane because we draw our, some of our drinking water from the Tuolumne. Um, this was provided by Mary Gudekent, who's a former member of this committee and a Brisbane resident. And she wants everybody on OSEC to have a copy. So I am planning to leave it at City Hall tomorrow. Um, and I guess I'll leave it, Adrienne, I'll leave it at the front desk. Is that where you want me to put it? Uh, I was suggesting with Diane Cannon, our department admin at the public works counter. Oh, okay. All right. So I'll leave it at the public works counter tomorrow. I'll probably be by there around 11 o'clock in the morning and you can go by and pick them up. Um, it's quite good. I've read it and Mary was really anxious that everybody on the committee read it. So that's announcement number one. The second announcement is that a couple of months ago, this committee forwarded a recommendation to the city council that it support Senate Bill 1173, which would requ which required the public pension funds in our state to divest themselves of their fossil fuel stocks. That bill made it all the way through the California State Senate. We were, to be honest, uh, very gratified and surprised that it got that far. But uh, in the assembly, it ran into an obstacle in the form of a committee chair, one person who refused to let it move out of committee. So we did not get that bill passed this year, but we will be back next year. And no doubt I will be back next year uh, asking OSEC and hopefully the council for its support for a new, um, version of the same bill. So I just wanted to let you know what, what happened. That's it. That's sad that it didn't pass because of one person. That's anyway, I'm sorry that happened. Yeah. Yeah. I, running into these strange choke points in the legislative yeah. process and committee chairs are are one of them. Um, I have, Michelle? Yeah, I have two announcements. Uh, the first announcement is, um, please mark your calendars for September 11th, Sunday. San Bruno Mountain Watch will be having its annual pancake uh, breakfast and plant sale. And I'd also like to say that I really need blackberries. So if anybody <laughs> is willing to collect blackberries, I need, you just put them in a Ziploc gallon bag and deliver them to my house or throw them in your freezer. Um, because I have not got the young gentleman who collected for me last year now has an internship. So uh, he cannot collect and I am desperate for blackberries. And my second announcement is that there will be a screening of the documentary Edge of the Wild which is about the San Bruno Mountain Habitat Conservation Plan and the Endangered Species Act. And actually I am um, prominently featured in the 
movie. Uh, inadvertently, I didn't intend to be that featured, but I am. And so it'll be in Pacifica on August 28th, and it is um, it's free, but you do need to go to Eventbrite to sign up for a ticket. Uh, and it's hosted by, oh my gosh, I don't remember who it's hosted by. And there will be a panel afterwards. Um, so uh, I'll I'll figure out who it's hosted by before the end of the meeting. How's that? <laughs> uh, well, let's see. Wait, I can tell you who it's hosted by. I have it here. Um, it's hosted by the... Um, Pacifica Community Center. It's the Pacifica Beach Coalition that is hosting the screening. It's at 6 p.m. on Friday, August 26th at the Pacifica Community Center. So I'd, I'd love to see you all there. And if you want to see the movie and can't come, let me know and I'll um, give you a link. I think it's also available at Brisbane Library. That's it for my announcements. Excellent. Uh, any other announcements? Um... Well, then I guess we're on to oral communications. Anything, Adrian? I did need to note for the record that correspondence from Dana Dilworth dated July 20th was received by the committee members. Um, that was all I had. I don't see that we have any members of the public with us at this point. Hey. Adrian, could you briefly outline what the communication was about? Uh, to be blunt, I don't have it in front of me because I had to just close okay. all of my stuff to be able to present <laughs> successfully. That's um, right. <laughs> and it's been uh, a, like a week since I looked at it. So off the top of my head, I really, I really can't summarize that for you. I don't know if anyone else can or I just no, remember I that it was to the Regional Water Quality Control Board. Regarding the Baylands, I believe. Yeah, waste. Waste. I think it was more broadly about um, landfill closure, correct? Like, am I, if I'm correct. Sorry, I'm trying to pull it up on my phone since I can't pull it up on my no, phone. I'm doing the same thing. Um, this was a, uh, in response to a meeting of the BB CAG which uh, community advisory group on the Baylands, I believe is what CAG stands for. And it was quite a well-written and detailed thing. Uh, so the, the title was um, Amending Waste Discharge Requirements for Bayfront Landfill. And uh, it was addressed to, as Karen noted, the uh, Regional Water Quality Control Board for the San Francisco Bay region. Um, is this anything that we should be addressing in a future meeting that Gendize or have a position on or anything? Or I'd like to see you guys talk about that under chair and committee member matters. Okay, thank you. Well, if there's uh, no further oral communications, I suppose we should approve the uh, minutes of the past two meetings. Uh, yeah, the April and June, since we missed. Uh, Shauna, the... Glenn, Glenn had her hand up. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say that I found. Uh, Dana's comments on my phone and when we get to that point I'll try to summarize quickly give a few bullet points of what it's about but everybody's got a copy and if we're going to do anything about it everybody needs to read it yes and I, I will just note that we um I think it's probably fine that Glenn summarize um what the comments were but we cannot have substantive to discussion about it without agendizing it. So I think the discussion should just be whether the committee wants to agendize it after, um, you know, kind of a summary. That in the chair and members matters, correct? Yes, that is generally the place in the agenda where we should have um, discussion on future agenda items that the committee wishes to bring up. Move forward to approve the minutes from from April and June. 
Are there any um, changes or substantive issues that anybody has with the minutes from April or June? Nope. nope. I move to approve uh, the minutes for April and June. I'll second. Michelle Sammons? Aye. Is that me? Yes. Approved. Uh, Shauna, I don't hear you, but I see your mouth moving. Anybody else hear me? Now we can. Um, Jason Nunes, Noonan. Uh, <laughs> and Mary Rogers. Approved. And did I, um, that was a Jason abstaining, correct? And everyone else was in favor. Okay. Just want to make sure I. Uh, yes. Yeah. Actually, I should abstain from June also since I missed the meeting. I'm okay with the, with the April minutes. I think that's probably the same reason for both of these. So I will just note that. Um, Okay, so um, before I introduce and turn it over to our guest speakers tonight, I wanted to start with a little reminder of what reach codes are and what we have in terms of our existing reach codes, because I know we've got some new com committee members who didn't go on this journey with us a few years ago. Um, so basically, first I'll just say a reach code is uh, essentially a building code that reaches beyond what the state building codes are. So they are uh, things that are formally adopted by the city that are stricter than the state level building code. Um, and so the building code cycle, if you're not familiar, is something that the state updates every three years. Cities have to adopt that on that same schedule and the next new building code would be going into effect on January 1st, 2023. We did this three years ago in the anticipation of that code cycle that started January 1st, 2020, so mid late 2019. And uh, we actually had done it um, in the cycle before that as well. So what we did um, in the past, there's a lot on the screen. I recognize that I'm gonna try to walk you through it very quickly. Um, there's three main sections of REACH code that we had. Um, we had a mandate to install so solar photovoltaics, so solar energy panels on your roof. That was what we did in 2016. In 2019, um, the state code had some requirements for some buildings to add solar, but not for other buildings. So we dropped the things that were no longer relevant in ours and continued the ones that were still relevant because the state didn't cover them. Uh, in the blue, building electrification, this is really focused on not having natural gas or fossil gas in new buildings. Um, the state did not have any such requirement. We adopted a code that required uh, small uh, multifamily and all single family duplex to be either all electric or at least electrically heated, meaning the only things they could have gas for were cooking and fireplace, and those would have to have electric free wiring requirements. And then on the larger multifamily and commercial building side, all electric was required except for uh, life sciences buildings, uh, financial hardship, hardship or where demonstrated need as a core component of the use. For example, I think they used um, certain cooking styles that require gas. Um, and then on the electric vehicle charging infrastructure side of things, I'm not going to go through this in a super detailed way, but just suffice it to say that we had very detailed and very strong requirements for electric vehicle charging. They are still quite a bit um, stronger than even the reach codes that are being proposed for this code cycle. So my recommendation would simply be that we continue these um, as they are. Basically everybody in any residential 
um, building would have access and there would be high levels of EV charging in commercial buildings as well. Um, and there's always some kind of um, caveats to where if the level of EV charging required is going to uh, trigger significant electrical upgrades, those can be mitigated in certain ways um, or have reduced requirements to, um, you know, just kind of keep them at the level that's not going to bump them up to uh, significantly more expensive electrical infrastructure, transformer upgrades and whatnot. So um, with that, just wanted to kind of um, introduce that as kind of what we already have on the books. And, um, you know, as far as where I think we should go this year, um, PV is going to be required for all new buildings. So we don't need to continue that requirement any longer. As I said, on the EV side, I think we ought to, you know, basically just extend what we already have in place. And then on the all electric side for new buildings, I think we should try to close any loopholes that we can. I really don't think adding new gas buildings is a good investment anymore. We're trying to get rid of them. Um, and then uh, the, the bulk of our conversation today is really going to be focused on beginning to consider existing buildings. How can we start to tackle the building stock that we already have that has uh, by and large has gas usage. Um, so I see a couple of hands raised. I guess we can go ahead and take those and then I'll um, come back and introduce our speakers and, and pass it over to them. Erin, uh, I think you were first. Yeah, just um, a quick question because I wasn't part of this three years ago. What is the trigger for when this applies to existing um, that will be part of our discussion. Everything you see on the screen is all for new building. Okay, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. I had a related question. This doesn't apply to major remodels, does it? Um, it would only apply to major remodels if they are significant enough that they trigger new building requirements, which I believe happens at 50 plus percent of um, building. Um, Karen maybe can correct me if I've gotten that wrong, but there are, you know, certain level of, um, you know, a major remodel that would trigger new code requirement, new building code um, being followed, not just in these areas, but in all areas. Okay. Yeah, you. that's my understanding too, 50%. Thank you. Right. Um, so at this point, I want to um, introduce Blake. I'm going to mess up your last name, Blake Hershaft. I hope I'm getting that right. Um, from Peninsula Clean Energy, um, uh, we have actually known Blake since before he was with PCE. He was with DNVGL, so he had worked with us a little bit on uh, some projects under the RICAPS and Bayren headings, and is now heading up this effort for Peninsula Clean Energy. And we also have Jose Garcia from TRC, which is uh, supporting PCE and the Bay Area reach codes um, kind of on the more technical side of things with cost effectiveness studies and uh, model code language and whatnot. Um, guys, feel free to add anything you'd like to your introductions. I know that was um, very high level. And uh, I'm gonna, oh, I need to stop share so I can, so you can go ahead and start sharing with. Thanks, uh, thanks everybody for having me. Um, and thanks for serving on this committee. Um, uh, excited to be here and talk about uh, existing building reach codes, which is something we're moving towards. Uh, here, I'll share my screen. Um, generally speaking, if we wanna get to zero carbon, eventually we have to decarbonize our existing building stock, uh, which is gonna be a little harder than buildings uh, all electric from the beginning. Can you hear a lot of road noise in the background? Okay. No. Let me know if you do. Uh, rush hour around here. Uh, I will just note that um, it looks like we have Barbara just joined. Oh, I'm not sure actually how long ago she joined, but Barbara is here now. Hey, I, yeah, I just had to unmute myself. 
Uh, I don't know why the subtitles are there. Are you okay with me leaving that for now? <laughs> Not bothering me. All right. Um, I'm going to try to go through pretty quickly so that there's availability for a robust discussion. Uh, please ask myself or Jose any questions. My background's mechanical and plumbing design, so I know a lot about the systems we'll be talking about. Um, why exist? So we're going to go through why existing building reach codes. We sort of just went over uh, types of existing building codes that uh, are up for discussion and that cities are considering. Uh, what other cities are doing, both in the state and across the country, and then cost implications, which is a really important piece. Um, if there's going to be any kind of mandate to electrify people's homes or building owners' buildings. Uh, 99% of our buildings are existing um, across the state of California, so that's where a lot of our carbon emissions are. It takes 15 years to cost effectively electrify our building stock. So if you have a target of uh, 2038, then you would want to start next year. Um, some measures are zero cost. Some need incentives to close the gap. Um, and, and there are some broad policy actions we're going to talk about that can help with planning. Uh, here's the measures that are being discussed. So end of flow ordinances, uh, Half Moon Bay kicked this off. Um, there's no immediate cost or carbon savings, but this helps with long-term infrastructure projects. So this is a city would say, we're going to turn off all the gas by a certain date. Half Moon Bay has said 2045. Uh, the state has a governor's order, but it's not really being used in utility planning yet. Um, hopefully that changes, and this is a way to use local government to change it. Time of sale disclosure, City of Piedmont has these. So there's a form in the stack of forms when you buy a building that says these are the fossil fuel items that are in a building. So it's just a disclosure on that. Uh, our team's going to create a form that can just be used if a city chooses to go this direction. Um, permit or equipment replacement, that's the most cost of, one of the most cost effective times to electrify is when you're going to replace something anyway because you're already going to spend thousands of dollars. Um, we'll go through that. This is going to be for equipment like water heaters, space heaters, clothes dryers, ranges, pool heaters, uh, maybe outdoor barbecues. Panel replacement electric readiness. Um, there's no immediate carbon savings there, but there's future incremental cost savings. So uh, you don't want to miss a chance when you have an electrician out. I'm putting on a timer here on myself while I talk, so I know I'm going quickly. And then uh, retrofit requirements, when there's a major renovation and it's kind of up to the city to determine what that is, $100,000 X square feet of addition uh, maybe requires something to be electrified during that project. I, I electrified two pieces of my home during a flood uh, renovation I had to do recently. Um, so the Bay Area Reach Codes team, which is Peninsula Clean Energy, Silicon Valley Clean Energy, and East Bay Clean Energy, um, East Bay Community Energy, have put together model ordinances for new construction and existing. You don't necessarily need to read this. This is just on our webpage, which I've listed there. I'm going to go through the model codes that are on the webpage. The text is really small, so I'm just giving a general overview. Um, and then we'll dive into it. So ton of text here. I would focus on just the blue and the highlight, which I'm going to read out loud because it's so small. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the ordinance we put together is meant to be a menu of policies that a city could choose from. We think that all these policies together, which may not be ready to pass all of them today, are the kind of things that need to be in place to decarbonize our building stock. Time of permit menu options by appliance type. I've highlighted the appliances on the right. If you look at B, a city might pass by January 1st, 2023. All water heater replacements need to, need to be electrified upon replacement. Maybe that's 2025. Uh, end of flow, uh, we discussed what that is in the point of sale disclosure. And then some additions and alteration language. We have all this uh, embedded in like a three-page document. Uh, there's also a statewide um, code option on there from like a state funded by statewide program dollars, utility dollars. Uh, it basically has a menu and a score. It's a little can complicated, but it's very similar to how the energy code tends to do things. Uh, you have to score, let me see, can you see my mouse? 
So you have to score 13 target points during a renovation. This is a renovation code um, to meet the requirement. And you can do all these measures to get points. And some of them are electrification measures down here, uh, which tend to get you all the points. Um, Peninsula Clean Energy didn't necessarily create that, uh, but it does exist. Uh, some things cities are doing. Denver has kind of a permit replacement that's getting phased in 2023, 2025, 2027, space heater and water heater requirements. Um, and then Vancouver is considering some alteration requirements, a renewable gas option, and a, a, a requirement that when your air conditioner is replaced, it needs to be a heat pump. Piedmont has that uh, more complicated approach and also the time of sale, time of property transfer, time of sale requirement. Um, they also have a requirement if you have a permit in your laundry room, you have to add a, a plug. And I'll go through more of that later. Chula Vista is doing that, a flexible pathways model um, and a time of property transfer disclosure. Uh, a couple, so Denver's is in, Vancouver's being passed, Piedmont is passed, Chula Vista is in the process. The city of San Mateo is on the same potential timeline if uh, Brisbane chooses to move forward um, and had a meeting last week with their uh, subcommittee on um, some policies. Uh, panel capacity and breakers reserved during a panel replacement is something they're considering. Make the panel ready for full electrification if you're replacing it. If you do a kitchen or laundry renovation, they want an outlet, or maybe you'd actually electrify the equipment. Um, if your air conditioner is being installed or replaced, you need to make it a heat pump. Uh, if you're adding a new pool in the backyard instead, and it's going to be heated instead of using gas, use electricity. Um, and then in general, just don't run new gas in the backyard. Uh, these are what they're considering. The, the air conditioner heat pump one is probably the most cost ready, and I'll go through those costs in a second. Finally, the heat pump water heater uh, replacement. Um, replace, uh, you have to electrify at the time of replacement, something they're considering. Um, that didn't tend to get a lot of votes at the subcommittee because uh, of the cost, and also it's difficult during an emergency replacement, which we'll go over, but, but there's a lot of carbon savings opportunity there. All right, going through costs, uh, I'm gonna go through that some costs are variable, some can be backstopped with incentives, uh, then just like a table of the types of costs um, and, and stuff like that. And I got maybe five slides left. Uh, so variable costs, some, you might wanna check your laundry room. Some laundry rooms, a lot more than I would have thought, have 240 volt outlets next to a gas dryer. So if you're replacing your dryer, you can electrify that for cheaper. This is like cost that I found on Home Depot delivered and installed. And the electric has, happens to be cheaper. Um, if you need to run a wire, there's gonna be a thousand to $2,000 in running that circuit. So it's really variable what that'll cost. Sorry, I'm pointing to, I should be using my mouse on that screen. Uh, <laughs> Now, an air conditioner to heat pump replacement, this really varies based on the building type, but uh, on the left, we have an air conditioning system with a gas furnace. And on the right, we have a heat pump system with no gas. You don't need to know too much about it, but they look the same because they're very similar, and thus they cost the same to install and buy. Uh, the heat pump's a little more, maybe zero to 3,000. Um, the tech program, there used to be a statewide incentive program that ran out of money for electrification, uh, had a $3,000 offering, meaning it was cheaper to actually go the heat pump route when the rebate existed. Uh, and it, we currently have a $2,000 rebate available with Bayren and are looking to increase our rebate amounts this year. That's what I'm like working on uh, at the moment. Um, I take that back. Oh. We don't have an HVAC rebate at the moment. We do have a water heater rebate of 2000. We're looking to add an HVAC rebate, I hope, which would help enable this measure. Uh, so this is what would matter in a home. No cost. This is assuming the incentives exist. A two-way air conditioner, uh, highly variable dryers, ranges, and heat pump water heaters in terms of the incremental cost increase. Some cost a new pool, heat pumps, 
are a little more expensive than the gas heaters. And then higher cost furnace. If you don't have, if if you're not planning on adding air conditioning, it's about thirteen dollars more expensive to go with a heat pump than a furnace. And an existing pool is pretty expensive to electrify. Uh, so these are kind of buckets, and 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 that's why some seem ready to adopt and some don't, um, because of the cost implications. Uh, finally, on the commercial side, Jose is putting together really good cost data for me, which he sent me this week. Uh, in some cases, it's cost neutral, and I have a picture of a rooftop packaged unit where it would be cost neutral to electrify upon replacement, and in some cases, it's not. I have a picture of a bunch of boilers, somewhat similar to the boilers at the Brisbane pool, which is being electrified, and it's more expensive to electrify the pool. And that's my time, so I'm just going to end with the operating cost. Uh, we're talking about plus or minus 10 bucks a month in a house. And, I, and in total, when you electrify everything, plus or minus a dollar, your electricity bills due to PG&E have probably gone up more than that um, just due to rate changes. So it, it's pretty much the same cost um, in the noise. And open it up for questions, discussions. I can go back to slides. Thanks, Blake. Jason, I think your hand is first. Go ahead. Uh, sure. Thanks for the um, uh, presentation. Very, very helpful. Um, I guess if you could just summarize, and I'm okay if you just jump to the conclusion, uh, Blake, uh, what the most effective, what the biggest bang for the buck approach was, and then second question is, what's going to be most irritating uh, to our fellow citizens? What do you think is going to be most uh, you know, disruptive? Uh, which path to take? Because I'd be interested in what the most effective thing is and also what the most disturbing uh, uh, way of, of approaching the change is. That sounds good. I, I don't have replacement, per, permanent replacements yet. We're working on that of like water heaters versus renovations. So I, I can't compare those directly. Um, but in terms of the specific pieces of equipment, water heaters use the most um, gas in a home, followed by space heaters in our climate zone. And then the other two don't matter as much. Uh, water heaters are the most bang for the buck. Well, I would say two-way air, con the air conditioner to heat pump requirement is the most bang for the buck. Water heaters next. Water heater has this issue where you replace them during an emergency and you want hot water every day. Right. So that's, that's got a real pain point that isn't quite solved yet. That's what I would say. And I guess what pain I meant like in terms of, uh, the stop flow versus the, uh, the, the you know, a time of renovation. Or oh, yeah, and end of flow is easy. I would say, I would call that no pain and useful. Time of sale disclosure, depends what the realtors say, we are talking to them. Mm -hmm. um, but no real pain for your residents, except the realtors. Uh, <laughs> but, and then there's not that much carbon savings in the immediate term with those is the, is the one issue. The renovations is probably a little less painful. Um, yeah, and then, and then we are getting to the painful part of decarbonization, I must say. Got it. <laughs> but you're saying end of flow is probably the least pain. It's just deciding what date that is. Correct. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Michelle? Yeah, I don't understand how end of flow would be the le the least pain if you uh, lived on gas, you know, like gas stove, gas water heater, gas whatever. And I was thinking about how old would I be in 2045 and would it make a difference to me, you know, and I think it does. I mean, it does for a lot of people. Um, and then I was recently in South Dakota and we actually were discussing this issue <laughs> around the dinner table. I know it's weird. Um, and one of my friends who's extremely, you know, never mind. Uh, he, he's like, well, what happens when the electricity goes out? Because the grid goes down a lot and we could freeze to death. And that was an interesting question because there's a lot of places in California where it would be really, really cold if the, and the power grid goes down and you can't turn on your gas stove, you can't turn on your gas heater. So that's a concern. I'm just curious about, you know, how you expect people to handle that, especially with the extremes of weather we've been getting. And even here in Brisbane, it, we, it can, we only turn our heater on maybe 20 days a year and it gets damn cold otherwise. 
So I'm, I'm curious about that. I, I agree with the course we're taking, by the way. <laughs> but I just want to know how to respond to these kind of concerns and questions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the power outage one is a difficult one. We have some answers to that on our FAQ. Um, I think about it at the appliance level, you can have, like when your power goes out, you, can, you have flashlights and candles. So you could think of cooking on a bar, on a propane barbecue um, or, or, so, or your, your gas tank water, your, sorry, your heat pump water heater tank will continue to, to flow until the water's empty in a power outage. So you do have about 10 showers there. Um, and then another important thing is some of our gas stuff doesn't work during a power outage. Uh, like if you need a gas, if you have a fan, if you're in your furnace, or if you, uh, a lot of uh, instantaneous water heaters don't work in a power outage. So it's sort of complicated. Uh, also our power should be more reliable. I, I will say that Burlington, Vermont is going down this pathway. Um, I happen to live in Tahoe City, California, and I am electrifying my home and a little less scared, but it's a very important issue here. Um, and, and there's a lot of 25% of homes in, in the United States are all electric. So um, that's sometimes how I answer it. Uh, my wife grew up in an electric home in a cold But where are those 25% of homes that are all electric? Are they south of the, you know, Highway 80? <laughs> Very good question. So, I'm like, because it's not really fair anecdote. to say twenty five percent are electrified if they're all in Florida and yeah. Texas. Oh well, Texas really suffered badly during that last freeze for a lot yes. of places that were purely electrified. They've they nearly some people died. You know, so this is a concern and we need to have, you know, and the power grid has been less than stable for electricity and people don't have an alternative. And it's one thing to say, oh, just fire up propane barbecue, but uh, or fire up generator, but that's a whole other ball of wax. So people are going to ask these questions, and we need to be able to respond um, and give them viable solutions for survival should these type of situations occur. And PG&E has not been particularly stable over the last couple of years in terms of providing electricity. So, and Texas uh, certainly hasn't been stable in providing electricity. So I, those are concerns. Just very uh, make some comments on some of this. Um, so I'm not going to say anything about Texas. Texas is a whole different ballgame. Frankly, their grid operator has a lot to do with their problems, and we mm -hmm. don't have that situation here. So um, I'm not going to defend PG&E either. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say, um, we're only talking about things that we're doing in Brisbane as far as reach codes are concerned. So I don't have a ton of concern about power outages that are going to have people freezing to death in Brisbane. Um, most of the power outages or the grid challenges that we've had in California tend to be at the opposite end of the spectrum of the hotter days. Um, and so that is obviously a concern that we have to deal with. Um, most of the studies that I've heard that look at what the grid impacts of building electrification are going to be are really a rising demand that tends to not be coincident with when that existing peak energy is. So it would be adding demand to those cold winter mornings when electrical demand or electrical capacity tends to be more than capable of meeting the demand. There's there's sufficient demand or sufficient energy on the grid at those times is my understanding from the studies. Um, and then I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the end of flow thing um, because um, I, I agree with Blake. I think it is an easy thing. We're talking about, uh, you know, almost 20 years in the future or 20 more than 20 years in the future. I would recommend since we have a carbon neutrality goal of 2040 that our end of flow should be 2040, that's 18 years away. A lot of people are going to have to replace equipment anyway, some point during that 18 year time span. So this is basically like a market signal that says, if you are going to be adding new gas right now, you should probably think twice about that because at that point in time, you're going to have to get rid of it. So that's going to encourage people to make that investment in electrification at the time whenever their existing gas equipment dies. 
rather than us forcing them to do it at a certain other point between now and then. Well, Adrian, that sounds good, but I will tell you that we had a three day power outage at one point and if I, we had not been able to cook food, that would have been really stressful for the people of Brisbane. It was already stressful uh, because they lost all their food in their refrigerators and freezers and that type of thing. So, you know, I just want to make sure, I mean, I understand and I believe in the goal, but I do need to be the devil's advocate and ask those hard questions because they're going to get asked of us in order to get this passed. And um, so it's good to say that, but the reality is everybody's going to say, but what about, but what about, but but what about so you know and and really yeah, i'm practicing really, my responses on you yeah so <laughs> also my, uh, uh, great goes out, your food's going your food's going <laughs> okay. bad in your fridge regardless of whether you've electrified your heating or not because that's always going to be i know like, but so. being able to cook a meal is a whole different thing or being able to heat your heat be warm enough to not freeze yeah okay so we don't know what the future holds, but we're on the right course. I just have to ask those hard questions. So maybe this is a dumb question, but Blake, you mentioned that the only modification to a house's wiring that you mentioned was in the case that there wasn't an existing outlet that could support an electric dryer. So does that mean that most, or if not all of these electrification changes could be made without um, redoing the house's electrical panel? Is, am I right about that? A really good question. Um, so, and bo both of these are topics that we research constantly. Uh, so uh, most, I just use the dryer as an example. If you have gas equipment, it probably needs a 240 volt outlet run to it. So that's a cost. And then as far as the panel goes, uh, a panel upgrade cost is something that we would recommend trying to avoid to keep costs down, as Adrian would know. Uh, so I was just uh, finishing something up with an electrical engineer today on this topic. Um, a house up to 2,000 square feet uh, can pretty easily go all electric within a 100 amp service. A 100 amp service is like a 1985 or before you might have a 100 amp service. Uh, there are three reasons to replace a panel. One is that it's unsafe, which is very common in panels from the 60s and 70s. Uh, that's something that can't be avoided and if an electrician is coming. It's not, I don't know the, if it's a majority or not, but it is common. Uh, the second reason is you need a service upgrade because of all this electric stuff. We don't see that as a problem as long as you do it right. And I'm finishing up design guidelines on that right now. Uh, there's a lot of work by Tom Kabat uh, called the watt diet on this that that is worth checking out and then the third reason would be you have a lack of breaker spaces that can be solved with a sub panel which isn't that expensive we have we do have rebates for panel replacements and sub panel upgrades um, but that i'm not as worried about the panel replacements as i used to be except for larger homes or homes with pools okay thank you Yeah, a um, couple things. Um, one, I was uh, in that chart that um, had on one of your slides about how much you thought each of these things were going to cost. Um, I think the water heater, the annual cost was, or the monthly cost was an additional $1 over a gas water heater and um, an electric Heating was eleven dollars greater than, yeah, and the uh, 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 space heating. No, space heating was ten dollars saving. Okay, I was mis. I think I was misremembering. Um, or I either I just read a line down. Um, so that does kind of just seeing this again kind of answers my question. Um, I, well, maybe maybe I need to rephrase it. So, I mean, we know that water heaters use 55% of an energy's home. And so I'm kind of curious why 55% net $1 savings and then the smaller space heater, the lesser space heater requirement at the $10 savings. Do you have any insight into that? You're muted, Blake.
All right. Very good question. Uh, I'm going to give you an annoyingly somewhat scientific answer. Um, so the reason that a water heater is roughly the same is that a, a, a heat pump water heater is five is four times as efficient as a gas tank water heater. And electricity is about four times, it depends on the month, but it's about four times more expensive than gas. So they basically net out. Uh, a space heater, especially in Brisbane's awesome climate, um, has a higher efficiency bonus. It's like five times as efficient as the gas furnace. And that's why it sees actual savings. Um, I'll note that in the rest of the country, the savings would be very high. It's just, it's kind of a PG&E, an SCG&E thing. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's that higher efficiency of the space heater. Okay. And then I had one more question. Um, you said you're not really concerned about a service upgrade. Um, but I think I'm just wondering why you're not concerned about that because my last or my my sort of sniffing around a service upgrade is those are pretty expensive. Correct. Uh, we think we can avoid them um, or we know that they can be avoided for most houses. Do you know what your service is at your house as an example or any house? Um, uh, our house is, is fine. We have a rental unit that we're thinking about doing some electrical upgrades on it and it's hundred and and according to what the electrician says we're gonna have to add like 16 new circuits because it's an older home and he's, we're looking at a service upgrade and just to get it up to the current code you know probably so if you go to all electric reach uh, sorry all electric design.org and I can send that out um, well, Peninsula Clean Energy and Silicon Valley Clean Energy offer free technical assistance to customers to deal with this kind of stuff. So um, if it comes to you needing to replace a panel and coordinating with PG&E, that's a little bit different than electrification, but we could at least talk about it so you can maybe avoid it and also the time frame to, to work with PG&E. But if you have all these extra circuits, you might, you might still need the panel upgrade. But maybe not the service. Yeah, no. Well, they we, they were telling us the electricians telling us that we're looking at it both panel and a service upgrade. But we'll we'll see. We should work with. Happy to work it work through it with you. We have we have, that's what the programs are for. And and it does take like to go all electric on a hundred amps for the typical home takes one trick, and that's either a low power uh, EV charger or a circuit share on your electric vehicle charger. Um, mm -hmm. I we can figure this out. Okay, yeah, because it's only that if it's a pretty small home, it's a thousand square feet, you know. Yeah, so that it's, should. It's not the amount of power in a hundred amps is very very high. It's twenty four mm -hmm. kilowatts. It's um the, the average home uses a peak of seven kilowatts or less, maybe five five to six kilowatts uh, in a given year, the most it ever sees. So there's there's actually a lot of space in that wire. Okay. Well, I'll have to do some more digging on that one. Happy to help. So I would say um, I did put that link um, Blake mentioned. Hopefully I got it right in the chat. And then also check out um, Tom. I usually say Cabot. Tom Cabot. Tom Cabot. Um, the, the Watt Diet. If you just Google Watt Diet, W-A-T-T Diet, you probably uh, will be able to find it. And there's a lot of really helpful tips on how you can um, do an, an electrification project without having to do a panel upgrade. I say all of this having done that before I'd ever heard Tom talk about a watt diet and having uh, the feeling of having wasted a lot of money. <laughs> Shauna? Um, yeah, actually, this kind of ties into what Barbara was saying, because some of us have a ancient <laughs> Ancient, interesting Brisbane homes with 90 amp um, services. I actually worked with um, a design team through the, through the county of, of San Mateo about electrifying our home. And not only would we have to upgrade our service, we'd have to upgrade our panels. And, and, and it's, 
it's big bucks. It's it's a lot of money, and and not only that, I have I have knob and tube wiring in my walls, so I can't I can't insulate, <laughs> and all of those other things is like at some point you're like, well, is it going to be better just to tear this bloody thing down <laughs> and start from scratch? At, at what point, you know, do, do those cost <laughs> benefits start kicking in? I would love to. I would electrify my home tomorrow. You know, I'd put solar all over my lovely sunny roof and, and run it all electrically, but those are some really big cost things, and I'd like to go um, see the world a little bit, too. <laughs> Ditto for me. So do you have any, any answers for people who are, <laughs> oh, you're, mu you're muted. <laughs> Sorry, we do have an incentive for uh, panels, but but it could be higher. The states was higher when it was available. Uh, agree with the the last statement, which basically said maybe electrification isn't your first priority versus other costs, um, and there are a variety, including travel and students' college and retirement, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, definitely concerns I think about and worry about every day, and and it. A careful approach to the city specific is going to be important here and potentially exemptions for certain home conditions um, as the in part as our contractors and electricians get used to uh, moving toward all electric and, and partially while rebates become available and slightly uh, more retrofit friendly technologies become available. So I, I would say for all the reasons you're saying a, a measured approach, but also at some point we have to take action. So there's a balance there. My answer. Okay, I think this is something Blake and I and some others have talked about extensively. We certainly are not looking to implement something that is going to impose massive costs on people immediately. We're trying to figure out ways that we can moderate this and do things that are cost effective and you know, maybe things that people who can't afford it, you know, if you're doing a big remodel and you're obviously choosing to do that remodel, then maybe there are different requirements or, you know, those kinds of things where we can, um, you know, try to do things that make economic sense for people while the market gets built up. Um, and I think it's going that way. All indications are it is going that way, but I am the first to admit this is not easy um and it is not cheap and we definitely need to be very sensitive to that Aaron, i think you're next yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna share my story as a way to advocate for the uh end of flow um kind of mandates uh we moved into this house and very quickly after that our gas line, or we discovered a gas leak, I think is the best way to say that. Uh, so $13,000 later, we had a new gas line. Right after buying a new home, so we had no money, right? Um, but it was, it was the pandemic, the height of the supply chain issues, you know, all, we were all looking at all those container ships and it was either do that or a new furnace, replace the really cool vintage Viking range, a hot water heater, a dryer, and the electrical service and panel both needed to be upgraded if we were going to do all of that electrification right then. So but at that point, the $13,000 for gas didn't seem like that horrible. Had I known if there had been an end of flow mandate at that time, we probably would have gone electric because the cost isn't that different, even though in the short term, it would have been really rough on us. So um, I, that's one of the reasons that, that I think those, those types of mandates are really powerful. That's, that's my story. Thank you. Mary? I think everybody uh, touched upon it, but I'm just worried about the affordability and all the different um, add-ons that will probably end up happening if someone were to change out their water heater to a totally electric one. And I think, um, you know, our job is to try to convince the community to go that, you know, to go fully electric. 
and I think there's going to have to be some type of incentives um, associated with that, whether or not Brisbane kicks in some dollars or PG&E kicks in some dollars or someone else does, um, because I think we're going to get a lot of pushback from the folks that have been here quite a while. I mean, that if you need to change out your water heater and it has to be gas, they're just going to go easy peasy. I'm going to go to Home Depot and get one and put it in. And, um, you know, and not incur all those extra costs that it would that would occur if they were to go all electric. Anyway, just the affordability factor and um, trying to sell it the right way um, to convince people that this is what we need to do. Anyway, thanks. I might want to say one thing to that just because I was working on this today. Like, uh, I can't guarantee what incentives we roll out and what changes we make to our heat pump water heater program. Currently, we provide a thousand. 2,000 if you are low income, and then Bay Ren does another 1,000. Uh, so that's up to 3,000 if you're low income. Then there's the panel upgrade piece. We don't think that's enough. And I, what I work, what I literally was working on today is trying to make an incentive that is as much or more as the incremental cost difference. We really want incentives that can make these policies work. Um, so that's, that is our goal. Uh, and I, I agree. We, I think we need it because there's not a lot of disposable income out there right now. So I just have a few comments and, and, you know, one of them is you mentioned low income, but there's a lot of hoops to jump through for that, that people aren't willing to do. And also, um, you know, our replacement toilet program hasn't been extremely successful so far. So, I think that uh, Aaron's cautionary tale is really something that we really need to put out there and let people know what's coming down the pike. Because a few years ago, we replaced our water heater and we went from a 40 gallon to a 55 gallon, you know, just so that we had, you know, enough capacity. But had I known this was coming down the pike, we might have gone to a heat pump. I don't know if the technology would have been that good at this point. And right now we're doing some uh, renovations on a property we own, a uh, jointly family property, and we're going to replace the stove. And I, during this meeting, I texted my brother. I said, hey, you know. He goes, no, I already got that online. You know, we're we're going for an induction stove because in 18 years from now, we don't want to be replacing a stove again. But if people know in advance, like if Erin had known, she would have made a different decision. And so uh, I think it's our responsibility right now not to wait until the, the, that it's up in front of the city council. I think we need to have a mm, what's in your future kind of uh post or column or reminder for everybody that this is what's coming. There is going to be an end of flow. When that flow ends, you want to be in the right position. You know, I'm going to cry my eyes out when I replace my antique O'Keefe and Merritt, which could run for another hundred years if I had gas to it, you know, and I'm going to have to modify all my recipes. But these are things that people need to know is coming. And I think that as open space and ecology committee and we're going to support this we need to start making people know now that this is coming so they can make these decisions now they're not going to buy a whole new set of lake crise if they know they're going to have an induction stove you know well, they're not going to buy work a... with induction okay or whatever brand <laughs> I, I hate them they're too heavy okay what am i going to replace my cast iron skillet with okay you know what i mean you don't have so to. Yeah, but, yeah, but this is what people need to know. Do they have to? Do they not have to? What goes on an electric stove? What goes on an induction stove? How is it all going to work? So I think education is going to be really key, but also knowing that there are deadlines that this, this is coming and it's a freight train and you're not going to be able to stop by standing in front of it. So get ready. And as much as we're not going to like it, this is reality. I mean, you know, this is reality. And and our, the lives coming up behind us are not going to live the lives we led. And we really need to make that clear. And we need to make it clear now on a daily basis so that people know it's coming and they can prepare for it better. That's it. Yes, um, I agree with you, Michelle, uh, but also uh, Adrian got through to me when she said 18 years, 18 years, a long time. 
It's a long time. If we talk about it, talk about it, talk about it. Um, 18 years is a long time. I know your stoves would last 100, but like just 82 or 78 instead, you know. So I just, you know, we don't want to be the people that are just waiting there and talking about it as the water's hitting our ankles and stuff. So um, yes, yes, we should talk about it. And yes, 18 years is a long time. People should figure their, their shit out. <laughs> You know, Jason, the last 18 years years went so fast, it's like, oh, you know, it'll be here before you know it. Is it too shop for a new 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 stove? (laughs) I mean, I I guess the thing I would say is if you're in a position of maybe your water heater's not that old, you don't have to replace it tomorrow, but it might be a good time to think about are you ready to replace it with electric when the time comes or if your water heater is 11 years old, maybe you want to be thinking about proactively replacing it or, or going down that path. And I think that's really the conversation that we want people to be having. I don't, I'm not going to tell anybody, go rip out that thing that you just bought tomorrow, but I, I'm going to hopefully catch them before they just installed something. Yeah. <laughs> and we don't want people to get up, to that I position. Know, and replace it with a heat pump. Yeah. It's the multi-pronged in the sense that, okay, we got to make it known that the end of flow is at, you know, 18 years from now. But also, whenever anybody buys a house, you know, there's some rider in there that says, just so you know, that in 12 more years, you can't have that stove, just so you know. Or when you go to renovate now, um, there's something that's triggered that says, just so you know, you can buy that kind of heater, but in 12 more years, you can't use it. So. If you could hit it from many angles, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, you touched on the disclosure, the time of sale disclosure, and that's something that Blake mentioned and we haven't talked a lot about, but I really think just giving people that information is is really important. Glenn? Uh, just, just to Jason's point, um, we have, I remember I've been on this committee for a long time and we did, I think it was like 10 years ago, talked to some realtors who were very resistant to the idea of disclosures. We At that time, we were talking about um, energy use and electricity bills and things like that. But um, that kind of disclosure really should be required when a house is, is for sale. Yep. And to the public education piece, I was just going to say one thing we could talk about and probably should is there's a lot of recent research on indoor air pollution. And it turns out that gas appliances are really pretty nasty. I wouldn't have thought that, Um, but it's very compelling research and we should start, we should figure out a way to to put some of that out there in bullet points so that people know that um, there's, it's not just the climate, um, but it's also for health, especially for children. getting rid of gas appliances is beneficial. Sounds like an article you're going to write for the star, Glenn. (laughs) Oh, gosh. Okay. Yeah, I can do that. Glenn, I can work with you on that. I I actually uh, probably have this halfway written from my um, being on the citizen side of the equation in Half Moon Bay and making some arguments trying to encourage Half Moon Bay to move forward with some of this just last year. So I've I've probably got a lot of language already ready to go, including specifically about that, because that was something that um, it turns out is super important and compelling to a very large swath of people who otherwise may not give a hoot about climate. Mm -hmm. Um, And having heard uh, PCE talk about this a couple times in the last week or two, I believe they are also working on some messaging uh, around this. Um, I don't know how much it will say specifically about how, you know, gas stoves lead to asthma and very alarming numbers of children, but, um, you know, it, it's definitely very well researched these days and scary. I'll, I'll work with you on that. Can I don't I... See any more hands. Oh, go ahead, Barbara. Oh. Oh, were you not trying to talk to us? That's okay. No, no, sorry. I'm, okay. At, I'm still at work, so. 
Erin, you started to say something or you had your unmute on. Um, it, darn, I have to remember. Um, I, it might have been the bit about the uh, the gas appliances in homes leaking little bits of methane. Um, I, oh, I, I think it was the um, we talked about time of sale disclosures in real estate. The other thing that does is catches new home buyers moving to Brisbane who aren't part of our outreach, right? So we could put everything in the star and hit it with Facebook, whatever we decide to do. But when someone moves to town, they're not going to know that. And, you know, they might buy a house with no washer dryer and they might make a wrong decision. So it's probably in addition to the realty disclosures, we might want to do something with the permit process. Absolutely. Yeah, where they're notified in advance. It's like, you just put in a permit for a gas dryer. Do you know that we're not going to have gas in so many years? Oh, I just remembered what it was. Sorry. Uh, the infrastructure. If PG&E knows that Brisbane is not going to have gas in 18 years, that's good for them because they know not to um, maintain the gas lines you know, beyond what they need to do for safety, but maybe to put more emphasis into um, power infrastructure to Brisbane. So that's another reason to do a, a end of flow type uh, mandate. That's all, thank yeah, you. That's a really important point. It is a very important signal also for the utility planning side. I believe there's some limitation currently on the books that, um, you know, in my mind, it seems ideal that if a gas line needed to be upgraded, instead of them spending the money on that, they just, you know, cap that line and spend that money to electrify those homes. And my understanding is they can't do that right now, but I would love to see that change so that they could, because I think we're just, we're not making smart investments with really big pots of money when we don't allow those kinds of changes. It's really not supporting our goals. So that's my like date. <laughs> Hope the CPUC will take a look at that one of these days if they aren't already. Barbara? Sorry, I hit the wrong button in it gave me dialogue boxes I had to dismiss. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we're all 101% by, uh, behind the fact that we need to set an end of flow date. Um, I just seem to remember Karen Cunningham had some concerns when we talked about this in front of Bagley, in front of city council. Um, but, you know, we'll get there somehow. We'll get there. Um, I think this committee's just totally behind that. Um, and then I think also another thing with the real estate disclosures is I, it seems like nine times out of 10, the first thing that happens when a home is sold is they take out some extra money and they renovate. Like, it doesn't matter how beautiful the home was when they bought it. They just got it. And, and it, I see this over and over again. So I think the real estate disclosures are going to be really another very important piece um because we owe it to these people and it's a good time to it's a really good time to catch people um we already have a, a water heater i mean the life the life cycle cost on it is really much better than a gas um water heater we insulated our home so i i we barely use our furnace so we figured out that wasn't going to be cost effective for us even though he was talking about the the payback being better just in terms of the efficiency. But you know, if you insulate and you don't turn it on, it, it becomes much less expensive, much less cost effective. Um, so I'm sort of wondering, I, I don't know how my, this may, this is probably too far out, but my thinking is that we should start uh, electrifying existing homes and maybe we should choose the ones we start with according to how many therms they're using so like a, a home that uses 
a hundred therms would get electrified before a home that's using 10 therms. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that has some problems that go with it because every system does. But that's just sort of where my head is starting at it. That's all. I would love to say yes to that in a lot of ways, but I don't know if we have that kind of data. Maybe PCE does, and obviously PG&E does, but um, that's something, unfortunately, that data access is, makes it really hard for these kinds of targeting. Yeah, if we end up extending the, um, the uh, whatchamacallit, the, the, not the energy store, the thing that we'll have to do with the, <laughs> the building efficiency program. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I was thinking for specifically the program, the EPA's program, uh, if we start extending that to residential, then mm -hmm. then we'll have some idea who who's using a lot of gas. I'm just thinking more about this real estate disclosure thing. Um, what we were talking about 10 years ago with the realtors, and I, I remember going to a meeting with them was um requiring a disclosure of home energy use uh to be available when a home is listed for sale and it seems like that would be a good idea as well as disclosing you know this this end of flow date when we have it i'm just wondering is there anything the county can do about that adrian i mean as far as disclosure like, requirements yes um um, Blake might be better poised to jump in and answer this than me. I think it would probably have to be adopted on a jurisdiction by jurisdiction basis. So the county would do it and it would apply to unincorporated and so on and so forth. I know the whole PC ad of, you know, what are the, the low hanging fruit things that everybody can do to be consistent. And I think disclosures and end of flow seem like those ones that don't hit anybody with an immediate cost mm -hmm. that if they could be you know ubiquitous in the area would be fantastic mm -hmm. and continuing incentives for electric electric appliances and panel upgrades yeah yeah absolutely i'm going to uh reach out to the county because there must be some things that they have jurisdiction on. I just don't know if there's any forms in a real estate sale. Mm -hmm. um, I really don't know. And it's, up, up, I will try to find out if it's a good idea. Sean, it looks like you might know something. Well, I was just thinking about, um, I don't know how long ago you tried to, um, you were getting all this pushback from the realtors, mm -hmm. but, uh, I look. I re, I just was looking at the disclosures that the previous owner of my house had to make 20 years ago when I bought my house, and when I sold my mother's house two years ago, the amount of disclosures I I had to provide is. Just, I mean, we already do so much, so I think there's going to be a lot less pushback at this point because there's so much more that we already disclose. Um, I can't see that putting this one more thing is going to be is going to push some crazy. I can think of one guy that might go over the edge, but um, <laughs> um, but uh, um, yeah, I, I think I think that's a really I think we're in a different time frame now. Yeah. I, I think it's really the amount of disclosure that already is happening now is 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 quite a bit more than what what was there before. So that's that's all I have to say. Yep, I do. <laughs> so what I wanted to add was, uh, Barbara, on the issue of uh, therms and, and uh, usage, that's a privacy issue. That's going to be very hard threshold to to go over on an individual level. And I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. So you can kind of put that one on the, excuse the expression, back burner. Um, and real estate disclosures, I think we need to mandate those um, issues. They may reduce sales initially, but not in the long run. And to me, it seems pretty essential that for a buyer to know what they're getting into. Uh, sort of like the CCNRs, you know, covenants, can, you know, that they have at the Northeast Ridge. These are things that people have to sign off on as they're doing a million 
DocuSign signatures or whatever they're doing when they're buying a piece of property. But it not only protects the seller, but it protects the buyers that they know what they're getting into. And I think that is really, really an important step. And probably our first, you know, I don't know if it's our first step, but it needs to happen. And if you're paying, you know, these days a million dollars for a home, you need to know if you're going to need to spend another half a million or whatever to bring it up to, you know, where you're going to be able to live in it for a while. So I just think that's, that's a really important part. And it needs to be kind of like CCNRs that you do when you buy in a land development like the Northeast Ridge. And, um, you know, there are other things like, you know, the sewer, what, what, what the law is in Brisbane about your sewer. You know, people just go, oh, shit rolls downhill. Well, what do you find out when it doesn't roll downhill and you have to pay thousands and thousands of dollars to fix a shared sewer line in Brisbane? People should know this before they buy. They really, really should. Mm -hmm. um, and if that makes them buy somewhere else, I'm sorry. If you really want to live here, hmm, this is what, what you need to know. So I think it's good for the buyers and it's good for the sellers and it's good for the environment. So we should really work hard on getting that in, enacted as soon as we can. Yeah, I guess I would um, just add that, you know, we've talk, been talking a lot about time of sale. I think, um, you know, it's a, a slightly different thing than a disclosure, but I think a lot of education can happen at that time of permit um, as well, working with our building department and making but, sure that people who are looking Adrian. to do work are... A lot of people don't pull permits. A lot of things. A don't lot of people don't permit pull property. permits, and they buy before they think about pulling permits. This is why I it needs to be at the disclosure point. Look oh, I'm not saying not seven. the disclosure. I'm saying we need permit time too. Oh yeah, I'm both. Both. A full frontal assault. Yes. <laughs> yes. Absolutely not saying not at time of time of sale. Absolutely, we need that. But I think we that can't that shouldn't be the only time because as you noted, you're signing like a million documents. A lot of people are probably not looking at all of those super closely. I mean, hopefully you are. It's a big investment, but fun. I was just going to say that maybe the way to deal with this disclosure stuff is at the state level. We have a senator in San Mateo County who's, who's very much a climate hawk. And I just wonder if it would be useful to... Uh, ask him if he would consider sponsoring legislation that requires certain disclosures for the entire state, because the, the logic, as Michelle was pointing out, is unimpeachable, but people should, people have a right to know what they're getting into. Um, and they should have a right to know how much is it going to cost me to, you know, to heat this house and to keep the lights on and the water hot and all that stuff. Um, and they should also know about upcoming requirements like an end of flow date. Um, so, you know, doing it at the state level would probably solve a lot of, of problems that we would otherwise run into trying to do it locally. So just a suggestion, I don't know how we go about asking our senator to do this, but um, something to keep in mind maybe. Blake, do you have an idea on that at all? Being a, a representative of more than just Brisbane? I would, I really like that idea and change at the state level has more impact. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason the reach codes exist is because the state is in some areas, California is my favorite state by a long shot, <laughs> but the state in some areas is not um, doing its job. So my recommendation there would be a, a parallel track I would consider passing it in Brisbane this year while working with uh, Senator Becker on a state level. I, I do think that some of the local action that San Mateo County is leading with is having impact. Well, it's definitely having impact in other cities at the state level, um, in other cities throughout the country. Uh, um, it, it's impacting Massachusetts, but, but I think uh, passing the policies helps move the needle a lot faster is something I've noticed. So maybe both. I was going to say this, basically the same. Like, here, here. State will take longer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> As you well know. <laughs> but 
but it's not a bad idea. I don't know if uh, if he has one of those audio law uh, things like uh, like Jerry Hill used to, but um, you know that's all, that's also something. There's there's a lot of advocates in in the county. I will say who I think uh, some of them at least probably have his ear. So. Um, know those those folks um connecting with um fossil free buildings and um citizens climate lobby and some of those others um you know might might also be a good way to go about it if they're not already thinking of this or incorporating it into their campaign okay we we should strategize about how to do that i know a few people so uh, i guess we're ready to move on I think so. If we don't have any further questions, it's been a really good and interesting discussion. Um, I really want to thank Blake for your presentation and Jose for being here as a backup um, for some of those technical questions that we didn't quite get into, but I know um, the TRC team is invaluable to this effort, so appreciate you standing in. And um, I'm sure we'll be following up with you guys as we go forward. Thanks so much, fun group, and uh, very smart and uh, passionate, and I love it. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, guys. All right, I'm going to see if I can share my screen and have my video on. Sorry, kicking all the way back to the beginning. Okay. Uh, I don't, Barbara, did you want to take over chairing the meeting at this point? Or do you want Shauna to go ahead and continue that since you're. Um, I, I'm happy to let Shauna continue. Yeah. If that's it, really, what is her preference? <laughs> I guess um, the new business uh, is uh, the election of the chair and vice chair positions for this upcoming year. And... <laughs> Adrian, would you guide us on what you think is the proper procedure for doing this since I kind of uh, got in trouble last time? <laughs> I want to make sure I, don't I wish I had here. reminded myself of that proper procedure. Um, if I am remembering correctly, I think we would be looking to committee members to make nominations, and then there might be discussion and um, a motion, and then a vote. I, Karen maybe has more experience with this. Am I getting that right? I don't have. The notes in front of me either good point but I think the self nominations are allowed as well and i don't know that i mean i don't know the discussion is part of it just who are the nominees and then we will vote mm -hmm. well since my hand's already up i nominate shauna to move up from vice chair to chair Oh, was, there this, second? was this the thing, Karen, uh, that, that you don't have to have seconds or no? Was that what the things that came up or no? That was a whole year ago now. I know. Come on, Karen, no. help us out here. I don't want to make another boo-boo. Well, wasn't, wasn't that the thing? And it was like uh, we were talking about nobody seconded it, and then it turned out you don't have to second the nomination. Actually, yeah, that's, that sounds right, because it's, not, it's not a motion. So putting your name in the hat kind of thing. Uh, I'll second, I'll second Shana, even if it's not needed, I'll second it. Oh, I, I was actually going to second you, Jason. I was going to nominate you as um, chair because- Decline. You, no, but you had you had uh, expressed interest at, in it last year and I no. kind of swooped in at the last minute. No, 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 no. no. I second yours and I decline mine. Thank you. Nobody wants to read the Brown Act. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, then I, I am, um, I know so Aaron Becker as a, as, as the vice, how about the vice chair, Aaron? I second it. I second it. 
Well, I wanted to second it. So I'll shut okay. up then. I'll shut up. You say. I third it. <laughs> are you are you willing to do it, Erin? I am willing to be the vice chair. Yes. Okay. And Shauna, are you willing to be the chair? Shauna, are you willing to be the chair? I can't hear you. Yes. Yes. Okay. 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 Yes. <laughs> So then, Adrian, do we call for a vote, or how does this work, or is there any other nominations, or I think you need we guys to guys wants to nominate others or themselves, right? Yeah, I think so. If there are any alternate slates of candidates, or <laughs> slates, <laughs> then I call for the vote. I second it. I'll third it. So Shauna, the uh, calling for the vote, I I call that we uh, nominate that we accept Shauna as the chair for the next year and Aaron Becker as the vice chair for the next year. So it's a re uh, it's a you need to do a roll call vote. Um, Salmon. Yeah, I. Yes. Becker. Aye. Rogers. Yep. Thumbs up. Jason Noonan. Yes. Barbara Evil. Aye. Yes. Donna, you're hard to hear again. I think it's your microphone location. Yeah. Hmm. What? I actually wonder better. if it's her microphone when someone else is talking. Possible. I think it's when she slides back and tries to look like she's calm and relaxed <laughs> instead of calms and upfront. <laughs> Sorry, little joke there. <laughs> okay, let's go on. All right, well, thanks, you guys. Yay! Yeah, I know. Cheers. I'll let I'll let Erin practice reading the Brown Act from time to time, just so she gets some practice. <laughs> Uh, once I do it once, you will change your mind and you'll do it <laughs> the year because you're really good at it. <clears throat> uh, so do we have any staff updates? A whole bunch, but you know, I had to close my window with all of them uh, that I had open earlier. So I'm going to have to pull them up on my phone. I should have been doing I, that earlier. I have a couple, so I'll go first. Go ahead. Um, I, I don't think I've, because we met out at the site last Time, let you guys know that on the transportation side, the city received a couple of grants since maybe April when we met officially on Zoom for a walkway from Alvarado to San Benito that extends the central alleyway, another block. And we had applied for this, this same funding, Transportation Development Act, I'm blanking on whether it's federal or not right now, maybe it's state, um, three times. So third time was a charm on that one. And then there was a county transportation authority funding for a congestion relief, alternate congestion relief, transportation demand management, which is basically like getting people out of their cars in transit. And we applied for improvements to the shuttle stops in Crawford Park, some of them are just the pad and benches and safety and some of them will be shuttles. There was a maximum amount and we had to provide a match and we received that too. Right. So those were positive things to, to encourage people to get around other than in their single occupant vehicle. And we also probably all of you saw because it was in social media a bit completed the tape seal asphalt rubber tape seal of Sierra Point Parkway between Lagoon Road and the 101 overpass and we got a grant from Cal Recycle to fund the increment to use um, recycled rubber tires in that mix and you get a long lasting pavement treatment that's a lot cheaper than just using asphalt concrete so we're excited to do that just this last month. That was that all? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I actually have some pictures to share for the first couple. Um, well, this isn't so much a staff update because you guys are here, but I wasn't sure where to put the picture and I thought this was a great picture. So uh, from our meeting last month. Um, and then I also had some pictures from our summer habitat restoration day this past Saturday, 
We had about 20 of us up under the PG&E lines, Buckeye Canyon, um, pulling Gaviosa, including one volunteer under two, which was adorable. Um, and my next item also has a picture. We've scheduled a trash to treasure workshop for Tuesday, August 16th, 4 to 7 p.m. at the library uh, community room. Um, so this is basically uh, supporting the trash to treasure challenge, trying to help people conceive ideas and implement them. Um, we've got Lisa Greenlee, who is on the Park and Rec Commission and won the contest the first year a couple years ago, um, who's going to join us, as well as Teresa Montgomery from Scavenger. So we'll be able to talk about ways to help people come up with artistic ideas and, and start to or, or complete projects. Um, folks are welcome to bring waste materials for use or sharing, but we do not want this to be a dumping ground for people to just bring stuff and leave it. So if you bring it and it doesn't get used, you got to take it home with you. Um, and yeah, that's all on that front. Oh, nope. Um, I'm not, just not going too. forward for that. I have other staff updates. Um, I thought I had another picture, but I don't. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, planning on coming, although it'll be late. And I'm, uh, it will be there also to help people. Did someone already make a Game of Thrones throne out of their uh, plastic utensils from the pandemic? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, council member Davis. <laughs> made, she, made a, uh, she didn't make a Game of Thrones throne. She made a beautiful oh, a crown. Yes, you're right. Yeah. 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 But you can do it again and reinterpret it. Why not? Yeah. Can make one from your water heater. Now that would be a Game of Thrones throne, not a Game of Thrones hat. Um, so my other items, sans photos, um, the Brisbane Village um, EV charger, the fast charger has been down for over a month at this point in time. We've been aware that it was not functioning for about a month and have been trying to pursue ChargePoint to take action on it. It has been a struggle. Uh, the latest info as of a couple of days ago finally seems like maybe we're getting somewhere with them. They mentioned that it seems to be a modem issue. They have a tech assigned who's investigating what part needs to be replaced and will be getting us a quote to fix it. So um, it has unfortunately been, I know, very frustrating for the station users and for me as well, trying to get ChargePoint's attention to take action on it. Um, but I have been calling them basically weekly, like, what's the status? What's going on? This has been a while. We need some action. So hopefully um, things will get moving. Um, uh, these are probably things that you're already somewhat aware of. The pool heat pump water heater contract was approved at the July 7th council meeting that was recently executed. Um, I also had the climate emergency declaration presentation to city council on their July 14th meeting. Uh, we finally, after about a year and a half wait, received our funds reserved notice for our uh, level two electric vehicle charging stations. Um, we're putting in, you'll remember, 30 across three different city sites. So we got those. Um, funds reserve notices in late June and are working to working with the contractors to complete the design and submit the permits by mid August to meet our 60 day deadline for that for that grant funding. So very exciting. Um, we submitted our benchmarking report to the CEC today. Um, the deadline was August 1st um, to get our data, um, the data submitted to us to date to the state. So we've got that. And then um, this will have some more messaging about probably more in August and September, but we are gearing up for sun shares uh, again, uh, September 1st through November 15th. They haven't shared a whole lot of details with me yet, but in addition to solar and storage, I'm hearing that there's a possibility there will also be building electrification or EV infrastructure um, opportunities included in sun shares. So, maybe helping folks who are thinking about it be able to take some action. That is it for me. 
<clears throat> I can provide a brief update on the building efficiency program as well. Um, at this point, we just have uh, 11 out of 99 buildings that we're waiting on um, that haven't submitted a report. Um, everyone else has submitted something. Um, about 70 are fully compliant. Um, so that's it for me. Awesome. Pretty close to the number of buildings we never got last year. So um, looking pretty, looking pretty good. I do want to like commend Rachel for her all of the work that she's done to get us to this point over the last month or so. There's been a lot of calls and emails and support for building owners to help them through the process. So definitely a time consuming thing and appreciate her help on all of that. I think it looks like that's all for staff updates unless there were any questions. Okay. Nice. So on the subcommittees, um, on the climate action plan, is there any movement there? Oh, hi, Glenn. Hi. Um, we haven't met, but I think that we need to, uh, to talk about reach codes among other things. And Adrian, is this the point where I should bring up the idea that I mentioned to you in the email? Adrian? Sorry, I couldn't get to my mute. Other things kept popping up in front of it. <laughs> um, I was thinking that was probably under chairing committee member matters, but if it's oh, okay. to the I can wait. Uh, committee. Because I think it was something to talk about agendizing, correct? Okay. So so we do need to set up a meeting uh, to talk about reach codes, I think. Um, fairly soon. So, yep, I will reach out. Okay. And get something on the calendar. Um, most likely on a Wednesday, 6 15 ish for Barbara's schedule, I believe. Yes, please. Wednesdays or Thursdays work for me um, right now. And uh, yeah, but I can't be in really anywhere before 6 15. I will send some options. Um, events. Anything happening in we that really one? need, yeah, we really need to have a meeting. We need to decide what we're going to do for day in the park. Um, Adrian, can you confirm that day in the park is going to be October 1st? I can. Okay. So. In the past, we've done different, um, you know, cool things to attract people to our booth. Um, and I think that uh, I'm certainly open to ideas for this year. And does anybody on the committee have any great ideas? Glenn. Um, <laughs> I love your ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, no, I just wanted to mention, though, you've probably seen this yourself, Michelle, but I know you've been away for a while. Um, PBNR was soliciting ideas for the community festival, and I was just wondering if you were aware of that and had been in touch with them. I think it was Lisa Greenlee that um, put out something that might have been on the, the Brisbane Facebook page. Uh-huh asking for ideas and and um several people including me submitted ideas for sort of environmentally themed things so if if it was going to be anything outside our booth which might be great i mean to work with pbnr on some environmentally themed theme for the for the day in the park you might want to get in touch with them. uh do you remember what what, what did you have any particular idea that was coming up? Well, I still like the idea of a carbon footprint pinata, and <laughs> uh, we did that once before at yeah. the community festival. Had a had a black paper mache foot, foot, foot. yeah, yeah, foot shaped pinata. 
So I like that. The other thing I was thinking about was a, a costume contest for little kids. Um, pretty broad, but energy saving themes. Um, just see what, what kids would come up with. And did you have anything for any ideas for individual projects for kids to do? I mean, we've done the planet legs, which I just loved and wouldn't mind doing that again. Last year we did the face masks. Um, yeah, you know, at, not, not off the top of my head. No. Anybody else with ideas that are popping up in your head? Cause we're open to ideas. Shauna, you're, you don't have your mute button on. What are you thinking? I can't hear you, Shauna. <laughs> um, kid, things that kids do is not my specialty. <laughs> okay, Mary. How, how about um, getting some cheap uh, canvas tote bags and they can decorate that. That way idea. they get away from plastic, you know, encourages them to use the tote bag. I know that's probably a little expensive, but um, that's all I can think of right now. So I don't, we had talked about having the um, trash to treasure challenge submissions displayed and having a, uh, like a people's choice award. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you're thinking we're doing that and a big activity too. Yes, I'm thinking we're doing that and a big activity too, because in the past, one of the things that one of the mandates of the community festival, I don't know if it's still the same, is to have some kind of activity for kids during the day. And that's what it's been for several years. So I'm kind of looking for guidance on this. And I'm sure that, you know, Jason and Mary are too. I've, I've done this the longest, and that's why I'm saying, what are we going to do to? engage young people so really open to ideas we can reuse one of the ideas from the past but i'd, I'd love to have some hot new ideas i think masks are still a viable option i mean i'm still wearing masks when i'm in a group even if i'm outside <laughs> so just don't think there's I, I agree with you that they're going to be in our future for a while longer i just don't think people want to be reminded of that right now i don't think that's going to be a thing that people want to celebrate right i i don't know not to I, I i kind of agree with jason also like cloth masks aren't particularly effective anymore. right right so, yeah. so, i think the sea of them is not good can yeah. we can we have them draw how about having them draw on their N95 masks with <laughs> with, with non-toxic pens? <laughs> All right. So please everyone try to help us think of an idea. And Adrian, can you schedule a meeting for the um events committee to address Day in the Park? Because it's coming up like a freight train and we've got a lot of other stuff on the agenda too. Yeah. Okay. And you guys put your little thinking caps on and think of fun stuff for kids. Next is education and outreach. Uh, we haven't had a meeting in a while, so we probably need to schedule one. Um, I'm just gonna bring up the library. Is it time to change the display? Yes, I was going to, I was going to note that. Um, uh, I wasn't sure if we necessarily needed a meeting about that because we've already basically like created the okay, structure. Yeah, no, All we really need to do at this point is create um, some posters. And um, actually, when I was up meeting with library staff about the trash to treasure workshop. Um, they actually followed up with me after that and they reminded me that our next topic is gardening. Um, so that seems like it should be fairly easy for us to um, work with. 
Um, so yeah, we'll start putting together some of content based on what we've already, the framework we already created. This is a weird time of year to have gardening, unless you're thinking about composting and preparation of your garden beds for the spring. Just, just saying. Fair point. I think this was probably meant to be a, a few months ago because oh. our first one was supposed to be like in the winter, and then it didn't end up getting up until like March. So uh -huh. March, or, yeah, end of March maybe. So actually, actually, the fall in our climate is a is a especially after the first rainfall is a, is a really good time to be planting and especially native plants. And uh, if mm -hmm. you did your, you know, if you sort of moved things around in your garden now and did a little bit of amendment, that would be actually a um, kind of perfect timing to prepare their gardens for fall native planting. Mm -hmm. I was thinking yeah, I mean, about the benefits of mulching and, and using your own tree leaf mulch is another good thing to hit sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but gardening's a, a ten a month, ten to eleven month out of the year sport. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, I know. Well, yeah, actually, as an outreach thing, fall gardening is probably, a, you know, a, a good educational outreach type type of play. Um, Bayland subcommittee. There haven't been any meetings. None. Thanks. <laughs> How about the open space plan update? So Karen, where are we with that? Because we completed everything we needed to do and I'm kind of concerned because there's been some activity on um, lot 89 and I, I would really like us to get this before the council as soon as possible so that we can go ahead and hopefully present to them and have them agree to making four more, however many it was now, acres as priority conservation acres so that they can be available for density transfers and purchase. So where are we at with this? This has been, we finished this work in October or December, December, or we thought we finished this work in December. Yeah, so, so I'm going to get it to council. I apologize. Yep. No. So when can we get it to council? Oh, probably September. They're not, they're not meeting till after Labor Day. No. Okay. Can we schedule it? I'm happy to speak on it and present it. And I'm sure Mary is too. And we'd really like to get this going. This is, this has been on my mind a lot. And there is opportunity for density transfers. Uh, if the people who bought those uh, properties in the in the lower acres want to build more than a single family residence or whatever, so I'd really like to make this available as soon as possible. Is that doable? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's let's have it for September and let us know when so that we can really prepare a good presentation to the council. I mean, we already have the presentation. Um, yeah. Right, so but we there, don't need, we, so just there aren't gonna, any. In front, of, in front of God and everybody, we're going for September, yeah? Yeah. Okay. So we don't need to make any modifications. I don't wanna be, um, I just wanna make sure we, if, if we have to, we get in front of it. So my understanding is it's pretty much buttoned up. Is that correct, Karen? Well, staff has to present it and then you guys can certainly add on come up and speak on it. Okay. Has staff added to it so we can see it now? I don't have anything now, no. Okay, but we're saying okay. September and that, and we'll be told which week and we'll be ready to. Yeah, yeah. We'll be Good. ready to support it. Okay. Good. Perfect, thanks. And Parker then we, we have not met, but we do need to have a meeting on this. So can we schedule one? Yeah, on a couple of these next ones, we, as we talked about last month, we, some of these items that we asked for got approved with the budget, mm -hmm. and we've been in communications with finance of like, you know, we usually get a document, an Excel document that says, here's the money and here's the codes and here's how you spend it. We hadn't got that. So I was like, you know, can we start on these? Because 
fun. Yeah, we need to get moving on that. Um, so I got the okay, then we could start. Oh, yay. Okay. Good. Because winter's someday coming, and we need to be prepared to deal with the, the frog habitat as soon as possible. Is there any way we can schedule, like, the the trough cleanout, or um, is that something that, because we were talking about either yeah. working with Parks and Rec on on that or, you know, getting some volunteers to... I thought, to, we, I thought the staff was to get a biologist um, or a couple of options to help us develop with the kind of plan to, how to deal with the area. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, that was, that's like one of the top four things we need to do, but I think cleaning it out is, I mean, pretty much is picking up the garbage that's sitting out there. Um, I mean, we could do that now. Yeah, we should try to have a cleanup as soon as we can before the rain start. Uh -huh. Okay, I didn't realize there was trash. I thought when you said cleanup, you guys were talking about, you know, the overgrowth. Yeah. Trash and know. some overgrowth. It'll all There's, probably come at the same time. Shauna, you need to step, sit forward or put on a headset. There's some extra sludge in the in the trough as well. Okay, so I yeah, I misunderstood it. I guess I thought that was what the biologist was going to kind of lay out a plan for that for you. I think the biologist was going to lay out a plan for us of like what we should do on an annual basis and what time normally we should do it. But some things are pretty obvious, and, and that part of that is, you know, cleaning out the trough a little bit so the, the water flows and there's no overflow problems that are going to make a, a problem with the building owners and, you know, and that we do get rid of any trash that could possibly clog up any potential drainage that should happen. So we really need to, we, our committee needs to meet, mm -hmm. map out a plan and push forward on it. One of the times I was I was walking by there, um, I saw a lot of oil slicking on the water. Um, I don't know whether it was coming off of the the um, parking lot there, but there was definitely like, and there was you know ta there was tadpoles. That this was before it dried up, and there was there was some serious oil slicking, I mean, hmm. which I thought was kind of distressing. Yeah. Yeah. We. Should I don't know if we can find out where the source of that is and put in a baffle to prevent that from happening or whatever. So if we could schedule that soon, that would be really good. Am I trying to engage a biologist in parallel with this or? Uh, I, think, I think that I don't want to wait to engage a biologist to take our first steps. So let's let's go if we don't have a biologist that wants to join us in that first meeting or in that on on staff already um i think that we should just start moving forward at least with a few steps and and outline a plan of what we're going to do that's my thought on it um so this committee maybe has availability during the day or it has to be evening Right now, during the day, it's fine with me or evening, either way. Yeah, I am I can probably do either Mondays or Fridays. During the, yeah, Mondays or Fridays during the day, the other days in the evening. Um, basic species ordinance, there isn't much happening with that either. That's me because we don't have Bob anymore. So let's focus on the first two. Uh, or did you guys say that you were going to look at the documents that we'd sent around before? I'm not sure. Um, I'd love to, but I don't think I got one. I think I might have joined the council after that. Mm -hmm. Is that great? Yeah, if you could send those around again, that would yeah, be, that'd be great. Great. And then we should meet. So guys, September. Do you think we could meet in September if we, you know, could kind of 
get up to speed, read what we have, and then meet in September. Would that work for invasive species? Or Aaron, sure. Jason? Sorry, yes, that'd be great. Okay. Do you need daytime meetings or evening? Uh, I'm done by the afternoon, two o'clock onward. Uh, so uh, either afternoon or evening. I just How about you, Aaron? Evenings are way better, but I can make an afternoon work if necessary. Okay. We aren't going to be meeting all that often, probably. Afternoon is better for me. Um, Tuesdays, Fridays are, are best in the Friday, afternoon. Fridays, I can do easy. I do Fridays. Okay. Fridays, good. Okay. Uh, after, after 2, 2.30, fine. Anytime okay. after. So I don't, I don't know if Karen's available on Friday afternoons. Are you, Karen? What, are we talking about dark skies? No, no we're talking about species. Oh, I'm sorry. Sometimes. Okay. Well, we could maybe meet once without you. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's kosher or not. Yeah, I think there was there have been a couple of uh, subcommittees that have you know done some of the work outside yeah. of the staff and then met with staff and kind of gone over what they've started. So that's okay. Okay. Well, if you would send us whatever documents you have that are pertinent, then I will take charge of organizing us into a meeting in September. And and we'll just because because we we really haven't started, so we just need to launch. And we don't have to be with staff. I mean, that's not part of the rules, right? It's just something that we do. Right, not the first time anyway. And maybe not the second time. <laughs> so I'm really wet behind the ears on ordinance drafting and whatnot. So I think staff, I'd appreciate staff being there, but um, well, yeah, whatever works, I think is. I think the probably. first thing we have to do is, is try to, to figure out uh, how rigorous an ordinance we want, what species we want to cover. Um, so we're not at the ordinance drafting stage. We, we need to figure out what we, we want to try to do first. High level concepts, what area is? Yes. High level concepts, I like the sound of that. <laughs> and, and we did a lot of work on that when I was on the committee of like, which, which plants? And sort of that we were going to have a variable ordinance depending on what the plant was, like ivy, you know, has to stay on your property, has to stay at least one foot from the property line, unless you're in a habitat zone, has to stay three feet from the property line, that kind of thing. So, so do you have notes on that, Michelle? I think I do. I really need to go through my notebook and look for them and send them to you. Because I know we that? talked about it. Yeah, I will. And just I wasn't poke on that me, keep poking me. I wasn't on that committee when you were on it. I think I joined yes, it fairly you were. recently, was I? Yeah, we were on it together the whole time. Still, if you could find the stuff, that would be great. I will. I will I will look, uh, Glenn, because okay. I should have done more while I was on that. And I had a lot of notes and ideas on it. So I will find those and get them to you. Great. Thank you. Um, can we move on to dark skies? Uh, so I have an update for that. Um, we had an internal staff meeting uh, with the planning staff. They had some significant concerns about the draft ordinance, and they didn't have um, a lot of capacity to, to go into and make some recommendations right now as they are wrapping up the housing element, but they anticipated giving us more detailed guidance um, I think they were planning to have that to us by mid-August. That would be um, after they got through the kind of final crunch of the housing element update. So we're a little bit in a holding pattern temporarily, but we do have planning staff, you know, understanding what we are trying to accomplish and ready to work with us to, um, you know, get to that point together. So, Karen, 
of the tree issues, did you want to meet with us or do you want us to meet on our own first? Again. Well, um, right. So we had what the committee subcommittee came up with um, a while back that we met with the liaisons about, but we do, we did get funded to do an urban canopy study. So I know that's not the, clearly not the extent of the committee, but I don't know how, I, you know, maybe we should meet to talk about again, the order of what the subcommittee wants to do. I, I would like to do that because I've also introduced some alternative, uh, at least one alternative to um, Davy Tree with a company that does do urban canopy re review. So um, I, I'd love us, I'd love for us to talk about that. Yeah, I think we need to meet again because last meeting um, we talked about it and we went over the differences between Mary's draft and my draft that was rejected by council and um, you, I thought Michelle and Shauna were gonna rework it. Yeah, well, we need to meet on it and, and so that we can start reworking it. And it's been a long summer, but yeah, let's let's try to meet so that we can, now that we have the funding to do the urban, the urban canopy assessment and where we're at with it. You want staff at that one? Yeah, I think so, because you're going to be an integral part of it, especially if there's funding involved. And I heard uh, Wednesday and Thursday evenings. For Barb. That's yeah, fine. Wednesday, Thursday. And then the next one I have, I kind of have an issue with Sierra Point Park planning, and I just want to say what I want to say about it. I really wanted to be on that and we voted for Barbara to be on that, and that was fine. But then I was very surprised when the city chose a consultant before they had had a meeting that included uh, open space and ecology for input on even what we were thinking about before yeah. they chose a consultant. And I, I, I found that really, uh, I didn't, I wasn't happy with that at all. I feel like they should have at least had a meeting that included kind of like, okay, what's our overall big concept before we go out and choose a consultant? Because consultants are very specialized in what they look at and do. So I just didn't feel comfortable with the process on that. I just wanted to express that. Very, I was somewhat disappointed about that. Yeah, I mean, I thought we were supposed to be planning, not just responding. I mean, I guess maybe that's council had a different idea maybe we were just supposed to respond to the consultants plan but i thought the whole idea of having citizen and committee involvement was to kind of you know give the public a voice but well i think we'll get a voice once the, the you start working with the consultant but i, I had hoped that we would have at least a pre-meeting before we chose a consultant because consultants are very specialized in, oftentimes in what they're good at um so i don't know i don't i just didn't understand the process so i'd love an explanation of that i mean we did that for uh the crocker trail we had the um opportunity to review i think three or four different potential consulting firms before we uh, went down that road so that is concerning that they didn't involve the committees with that. Yeah, I was and expecting that they did it for to be more. Because that's going to be a big project as well. So, yeah. and that, uh, that's the kind of process I expected, yeah. but yeah. I was surprised when that came up on the agenda and they approved a consultant before yeah. having a meeting with the, yeah. the, at least with us, yeah. our representative. Yeah. I don't, we can't speak to that because we didn't get really any advance notice either we weren't directly involved but we were supposed to be directly involved oh, i mean even the problem. staff i mean adrian and i so how did that come about then I, it was from i think it was from uh the rec department well that's mm, not even, copacetic right but i don't even know who was on the selection committee i we just weren't a part of that at all but well, can you voice our concern over that to the powers that be? Yeah. That would be appreciated. 
because I don't want us to get left out again like that. Has anybody been contacted that they're having a meeting? You're involved with a start or a kickoff or anything like that? No. Oh, I guess it would be Barbara. No, I haven't heard anything, and I would I would think I would hear some something through staff, but no. It's just like I was on that beautification committee for two years and never heard a word, <laughs> you know, so <laughs> it's kind of like we're here, we're serving and you said you would include us and then you don't. And that's hard. That one might have been a factor of COVID. I don't think that there was a meeting of that committee. No. Right. And now that committee doesn't seem to exist anymore. But this is a real thing. And we just hired a consultant for a big bucks without uh, any input from open space and ecology. Yeah, I, I hear yeah. you. Okay, good. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, can I ask? A, I'm sorry. Can I ask a question? Just going back to the zero point park planning. I mean, you would you would uh, hope that the same committees were invited for input that were on the Crocker Trail committee, because you kind of want it to flow, right? So, anyway, that's the question. Were they? Yeah, were they? Yeah. So I, I don't think we have a. Yeah, were were they invited? Well, we weren't obviously, but was like the art committee in, invited, right? Because they were all part of the Crocker Trail, as you know, right? And and in this case, we actually you know selected a liaison yeah. at the request of the council. And then to not be included was uh, distressing. Well, if, if I were to guess, there, I, I would think that there's at least the intent to include these selected committee members going forward. I don't know anything about why they weren't included in what was already been done. And I, as far as I know, just from when this committee formed in in conversation with rec staff I, they have a representative on that but i didn't you know ask for an exhaustive list at the time i kind of assumed that that was the flow of communication was either going to be involving your staff or directly from rec staff so i'll, I'll look into it because you know please do yeah a month you know we were we appointed someone to this committee months ago and then somebody decided it was time to go i I assume I assume council was directing this, but I will I'll ask and, and get back to this. Yeah, because I feel I feel like we have an important voice here, regardless of who on the our committee represents us, because you know, this here point marina, there's marshlands, there's fishing piers, there's all kinds of open space that needs to be addressed. And you know, I, I mean I I think it's important we have our, our a voice in this, especially I really do you know so thank you karen right, thank you for and, looking into it and your appointed committee person is getting input of you know all of the community all of osec people that have sustainability minded ideas so it's not just going to be barbara acting yeah. around she's going to work with her. yeah exactly. we're, you can be sure we'll tell her what we want <laughs> <laughs> no doubt no doubt all right so, um, that's all for the subcommittees today, then uh, we can move on to the calendar item. Uh, calendar items. Uh, we have, well, we have Habitat Day. We've got Trash to Treasure Workshop August 16th and Coastal Cleanup Day September 17th and Day in the Park October 1st. So we've got a slew of events coming up in the next few months. Um, we also, um, in your August star, we'll see that trash to treasure workshop um, flyer that I shared, as well as um, some messaging about the foodware ordinance and a related expo. Um, so that is also um, moving forward. The county has started a more significant outreach effort on foodware ordinance uh, coming up for the, the implementation of that starts on October 1st. So you might start seeing more around about that. Um, 
Uh, I guess I would say Dark Skies at this point is very tentative based on what we hear back from planning. I've moved it back. I don't know if we'll have to keep moving it back. Uh, we had planned to have um, Rachel present next month on the building efficiency program as kind of part of her internship, um, you know, completing her internship. Um, and we have uh, some visualization and other things in the works. So that's that's what we're planning for next month and um, TBD exactly beyond, but we've got some other things that we can be following up on as well. Calendar questions? Anything I missed? Hopefully not. Seems pretty full already. Are, are we going to have a habitat or planting day uh, in December or January or even hey. November? I assumed so. Uh, we have usually been doing them in January the last few times. Uh, we might want to reach out to our Ariel and San Bruno Mountain Watch and find out if we wouldn't maybe be better to schedule in December or November. January gets really busy for San Bruno Mountain Watch if we're going to do it in conjunction with them and also planning on the plants and what we're going to do. Not, so not, for, not for nothing. Uh, isn't December a heck of a month for people with uh, entertaining and this and that and this? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I know San Bruno might be busy, but I think people might be busy. I think that has a lot to do with why we've differed in, in most other years, just because it's hard to get attention during the holiday. <laughs> And you're right, Jason, but if we reach out now and find out an availability, we could set a date for January or we could find out, you know, we don't want to wait too late in the season because the plants won't grow as well. I, so, I don't know what I'm doing in December right now. So. <laughs> you're going to be crazy busy. We all are. But uh, a planting day requires us to grow the plants before we can plant them. So we need to reach out now to um, Ariel at San Bruno Mountain Watch and find out what's optimal and when we can do that because uh, we've been really, really, San Bruno Mountain Watch has been really busy. So, and I don't want us to miss that opportunity. Well, I, I would vote for November versus December just because everyone's lives get very, very heavy. I agree with you. And if we can squeeze one in, um, like, you know, near the end of November or, you know, the Yes, I agree with you. Yeah. And then do we have a theme for our meetings during November? And are we going to decide on whether we're going to have a meeting in December? Uh, last year, or maybe last several years, we've had just one meeting um, because both November and December, being that our meetings are at the end of the month, have tended to be very, very near the holiday times. I believe last year we ended up doing something like that first week of December. Mm -hmm. um, we can talk about that date now, or we can talk about it next month at a later time um you know we've got I'm okay reminding myself it is only july right now so yes. we've got some time yes. but to there's a I know. To the it's table. only july Sorry. but it's almost nine o'clock yes yeah. uh, can to I... adjourn on the table any seconds any seconds uh, aaron aaron was trying to say something Go Sorry. Ahead. um so we just talked about not having meetings in November and December, and I would like to say we do have a special opportunity in November because there are five Wednesdays. Uh -huh. and no one ever plans anything for the fifth Wednesday of a month because it only happens yeah. twice a year. Yeah, November 30th. We should have a meeting on November so, 30th. So, so I, I would be willing to postpone our meeting by a week and, and get it out of the Thanksgiving holiday week. Uh -huh. Just a suggestion. And then not have December, which falls between Christmas and New Year's with you. Absolutely. Correct. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I think that's roughly on par with what we did last year. I think the date just happened to be December 1st instead of November 30th. So I, I want to say I'm good with that. And I'm trying to look at my calendar. Uh, Check your records, Erin. You're at every meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I did have it. 
let's go ahead and pencil that in and maybe we can confirm next time folks can check your calendars um on my plan yeah yeah and then on chair and committee matters there's two things one i'd like for us to discuss in our next meeting the letter that dana uh, sent and uh, be able to take action on recommendations on that so i'd like to have that agendized and the other chair and committee matter that i wanted to bring up is on our minutes and uh what we report i would like to have the handouts or whatever was on the screen from the prior meeting from that meeting that the minutes are for included with the minutes i used to get a paper agenda and uh, i used to have all of that and i would keep it in a binder and it's very difficult because when you go back and look at the agenda none of the handouts are when you go back and look at the minutes the handouts are not included in the minutes you can't see what was presented it's just action minutes so i i would like us to include uh you know since we're now all virtual can we please have a copy of what was presented in the meeting in the next minutes because we don't even get them when we get the agenda we don't get them when we get the minutes and i want to see i want to have a record of what we talked about and what the handouts were or what the non-handouts were is that possible adrian i don't see a problem with that Okay, so I'd like that going forward, including tonight's meeting, because I think the things that he presented were really interesting. I'd like copies of that. I think they should be included in the minutes. Uh, I I will have to check about actually like having them attached as part of the minutes, but I don't see a problem with sharing them. Okay, great. Um, I think Thank we will you. To confirm with probably with the city clerk about okay. how the best way to do that is. Um, okay. I have no problem with with sharing them. Okay. Um, I will note that as far as requesting agendizing something, I think we do kind of need consensus on that. I don't think we necessarily need to take a vote, but it, it should be at least a consensus, not one person. So. Majority, majority or the chair. Okay. Barbara could just decide. You there, Barb? Or Shauna could decide since she's the new chair. <laughs> I I I can I concur. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was sorry, I was stuck on mute. Um, yeah, I was going to say, let Shauna decide. She's chair going forward, so. No order. Um, and we're talking about having the Dana thing agendized. Yes, please. That sounds good. And Glenn has her hand up. So, yeah, I was going to ask the committee, make a long story short, I listened to a very good podcast this afternoon, which featured a couple of attorneys talking about what President Biden could do if he were to declare a climate emergency for, for the country. And it turns out he can do quite a lot. Um, he can invoke the Defense Production Act and start cranking out things like heat pumps. Um, he can stop offshore oil exploration and production. He can stop oil exports. Um, it's really quite a lot of stuff he can do. And I sent the podcast to Adrian right before this meeting and she can distribute it to the committee. So what I'm wondering about what I propose that we discuss is since the council has approved a climate emergency declaration for Brisbane, whether the council would be willing to write to President Biden and ask him to declare a climate emergency. Um, it could be that Biden will do that before we meet again, but he seems pretty resistant to it. I wrote to him myself. I got a boilerplate letter back today that didn't sound very promising. So I'm just wondering if, you know, cities weighing in on this might make some difference so i thought maybe we could discuss that so is that something you want on the agenda glenn for next month yeah provisionally cool. i mean if he goes ahead and does it you know uh obviously it's that's moved. unlikely so i'm good with agendizing that if everyone else was 
that agenda is that interesting topic adrian can send the podcast link to everybody if if people want to listen to it it's really quite interesting mm -hmm. i have a quick question i know that we're discussing the plan is to discuss it next month but would it be an executive order or would it be different than an executive order uh the climate emergency would be an executive order this the president can do that if he or at some point she feels it's necessary like trump did it right for the wall for the um what he claimed was an emergency at the southern U.S. border. So it's an executive order. Other chair or member matters? Sorry, I just realized I hadn't ever advanced to that slide. But. We need, really need to update the pictures now. <laughs> yeah. Please. Long, long overdue. Does everybody want to just send me your favorite uh, headshot? Yeah. <laughs> I think it might be a better way than trying to get screenshots off of Zoom. <laughs> and our next meeting should be scheduled for August 24th. That's the fourth Wednesday. Yep. August 24th. I think Jason wants to uh, make yeah, a motion to adjourn. <laughs> I repeat my motion to adjourn. I second. <laughs> oh. Thank you all so much. So hungry. Thank you. Have a good, good night. Good meeting. Hey, thanks, Bye, guys. Good night. Good night. Good night.